So everybody knows that when it comes to fictional depictions of the U.S. military, G.I. Joe is far from what you would call accurate. I mean, granted that for at least the first year of the toy line, Hasbro didn't stray too far from your traditional green army men. Moving forward, things got a little bit more creative. And it wasn't long before the real American heroes completed their very own sub-team of village people, which of course included their very own sailor. By the fourth year of the toy line in 1985, G.I. Joe was in full swing with a successful comic from Marvel and a popular cartoon series by Sunbow. And at this point, the character designs had gone in all sorts of direction that I don't think anyone batted an eye when Hasbro decided to throw in a Joe dressed in full-on sailor attire, complete with bell-bottom trousers, light blue chambray shirt, white Dixie cup hat, and armed with an old-school flintlock pistol. And given that we already had animal companions like dogs, eagles, wolves, werewolf? Their wolf, sorry. Since we already had animals in the Joe ranks, a bright green parrot just seemed like par for the course. And that, in a nutshell, was pretty much the G.I. Joe sailor, Shipwreck, and his trusty companion so creatively called Polly. Actually, on an aside, as part of a competition to name Shipwreck's parrot that was held in the pages of the Marvel UK comic counterpart of G.I. Joe, Action Force, the name Seasick won out but was ultimately never used. I don't know, I kind of think that Shipwreck and Seasick has a better ring to it, but whatever, I'm sure the name Polly appeals to those to whom it appeals. Besides, can't give Seasick a cracker. So among my close circle of friends, Shipwreck's action figure was one of the more popular ones, but not for the reasons that you might think. See, back then, we were really into the Joe file cards, and we especially took ownership of specific Joes that shared our first names. And for the longest time, my three friends had the Joes Bazooka, David Katzenbogen, Barbecue, Gabriel Kelly, and Shipwreck, Hector Delgado, to call their own. I myself had to wait a little longer for the first Joe named Chris to be released. Christopher Levine, aka the MP Law. Actually, I'd call Fallen my friend Javier, who wasn't Hector. He just shared the last name Delgado, but whatever. My Joe came with a dog, so there. Anyway, aside from the fact that Shipwreck's design was actually more on the conservative side compared to fellow Joes like Gung Ho, Toll Booth, or Spirit, most likely the main reason why the sailor's addition to the team didn't take many of us by surprise was that, well, We'd already seen him before, a whole year prior actually, when Shipwreck made his official debut in the 1984 cartoon miniseries, The Revenge of Cobra. So let's start from the beginning, shall we, with his introduction. As the story goes, after crashing in the desert following an unsuccessful encounter with Cobra's weather dominator, the Joes, Flint and Mutt, find their way into a bar, or to be more specific, the Cobra Cafe, a wretched hive of scum and villainy. And despite their Cobra duds, the Joes still manage to attract attention and end up fighting with and beating up the clientele as a mysterious sailor casually sits by reading the Cobra news. After the fight, Shipwreck makes his introductions. But first, I mean, I get it. Shady stranger in a shady place. But you know, junkyard approved, so it's all good. Anyway, after the dog's approval, Shipwreck offers the two Joes a way out with his custom desert sail ship. And despite almost getting lost in a desert storm, the trio managed to make it out all the way back to Joe headquarters. And just like that, Shipwreck is a Joe. And not just any Joe, but possibly one of the most memorable characters from the cartoon. Almost immediately being quite a pain in the shell, laying on the smarm on Flint's girl Lady J, and playing third wheel to the couple in the cockpit of a Sky Striker. I mean, seriously, you just met this guy at the Cobra Cafe. And now he's calling Shotgun on your jet? Oh well. Now here's something I didn't know, and that it's apparently been speculated that Shipwreck's appearance was based on my favorite Beatle, George Harrison. To be honest, I don't see it, but you know what they say, knowing is half the battle. What is confirmed though is that Shipwreck's voice, done by the voice actor Neil Ross, was supposed to be a cross between Jack Nicholson's character from the 1973 film The Last Detail and Popeye the Sailor Man. Oh, and Polly? Well, he was oftentimes voiced by the legendary Frank Welker, voice of the Decepticon leader Megatron, from alien robot to parrot. Now that's what I call range. 
Anyway, like I said, after his debut, Shipwreck also had a major part in the next miniseries, The Pyramid of Darkness, wherein he and Snake Eyes infiltrate a secret Cobra underwater base with Parrot and Wolf in tow in order to obtain a highly technologically advanced item called a laser disc that contains data on how to take down said pyramid. It's quite the adventure that involves some stage performing, break dancing, go ninja, go ninja, go! Dress up, escape via pump trolley, man, look at that wolf go. Werewolf? Werewolf. And finally, riding into Joe headquarters on cows. I swear, I'm not making this stuff up. And they accomplish all of this with the help of a lounge singer named Satin, whom Shipwreck ends up getting quite close to. A reoccurring theme with Shipwreck in the cartoon, who turns out to be quite the ladies' man. In another episode, Shipwreck rescues an escaped Cobra agent named Mara, who had just recently undergone an experimental procedure to create amphibious soldiers who could breathe on land and in water. Unfortunately, the experiment was only partially successful, leaving Mara unable to breathe out of water for more than a few minutes, I mean. She literally had gills. But of course, that didn't stop old Shipwreck from falling in love with her as well. But possibly the most memorable story arc that Shipwreck basically played the lead role in was the two-parter There's No Place Like Springfield, who many OG fans peg as one of the best stories from the series. In the episode, Shipwreck and Lady J rescue a scientist from Cobra named Professor Mullaney, who has developed a secret formula that basically turns water into wine. Just kidding, I meant explosives. I never drink wine. Anyway, while on the run from Cobra, Mulaney transfers his formula via a neural transceiver into the subconscious memory of Shipwreck with the only way of recovery through a password that is only given to Lady J. I see you, Polly. So as the story goes, the two Joes are separated in battle and Shipwreck finds himself trapped in the cockpit of his sinking shark sub, losing consciousness, and he wakes up in a hospital bed six years later. In a world where Cobra is defeated and the Joe team is disbanded, and he is married to a now normal Mara with a daughter named Althea. Of course, this is obviously just a grand ruse set up by Cobra, who actually have Shipwreck as their prisoner, set up in this fake town of Springfield, populated by friends and family who in reality are synthoid beings created from pseudoplasm, grown in a lab. It's alive! who apparently have a tendency, literally, to melt before your eyes. Yeesh. Anyway, after numerous unsuccessful subtle attempts to extract the formula from Shipwreck's brain, Cobra gets desperate and subjects the sailor to straight-up interrogation with a Crimson Guard cadet named Deming, who utilizes her sexy voice and some psychedelic lights to delve deep into Shipwreck's subconsciousness in an effort to extract the formula. But even in this semi-sleep state, Shipwreck's charm is just too much for the cadet to resist and she ends up jumping on him on the table, screaming with reckless abandon, unleashing flying spirits until she collapses onto the floor. Like I said, ladies man. Eventually, Shipwreck figures out that something is up when his gray hair basically disappears after he washes his face. You'd think after going through all the trouble of creating an entire fake town, Cobra would invest just a little bit more on better hair dye. But in the end, thanks to the help of his trusty pal Polly, who apparently manages to secure a tiny doohickey that melts synthoids in an instant and recites the password frogs in winter to unlock the secret formula from Shipwreck's head, they both managed to escape. But not before seeing his supposed family, his beloved Mara and instant daughter Althea, melt before his eyes. Hey, I know they were fake, but man, that's gotta hurt. But not as hurt as I would be if you choose not to help me out with my channel. Just kidding. I know you're all awesome viewers that are always willing to help me out by liking this video, leaving a comment, or if you haven't yet, a sub to my channel. But regardless of whichever way you choose, it will always be much appreciated. So thank you. And now back to the story. Unfortunately though, after that awesome two-parter, despite continued appearances in the show, Shipwreck is basically relegated to at best a slacker and at worst, one of the most incompetent Joes on the team. Case in point, in the episode Once Upon a Joe, during a battle, Shipwreck manages to shoot down a Cobra Firebat. Good. Which then proceeds to crash into an orphanage. Bad. And after the battle, 
As the Joes work to rebuild said orphanage, Shipwreck pretends to be inept in order to get out of helping his teammates, just to get some R&R. &R. But perhaps the worst treatment of the poor sailor would be in the episode The Most Dangerous Thing in the World, wherein while General Hawk is away in Europe, Cobra sends false orders from the Department of Defense computers, promoting Shipwreck, Dial Tone, and Lifeline to the rank of Colonel. And while the results are quite disastrous, with three of the most inept leaders often in conflict with each other, causing much confusion in the Joe ranks. Thankfully, Hawk manages to return from his European vacation just in time to right the ship, but not before a desperate shipwreck misuses the Joe base's particle beam gun during a Cobra attack, which causes it to crash into the base, burying him in the wreckage. Son of a glitch. At the end of the episode, Hawk assesses the situation and he comes to the conclusion that the three Joes were targeted by Cobra for the specific reasons that Lifeline, despite having the ability to lead, lacked the desire, and Dial Tone, possessing the desire but not the ability to lead, and Shipwreck, well, he basically lacked both desire and ability. Ouch. But it's not all bad, I guess. I mean, in both cases, Shipwreck managed to do some good. First, he was able to make the constant Joe frenemies Leatherneck and Wetsuit get along with their shared dislike of him. And well, to be fair, despite his drawbacks, Shipwreck was quite good with the kids, as was showcased in Once Upon a Joe, wherein he keeps the orphan kids entertained with this riveting tale of the shoemaker Daduk, who lived in a combat boot along with his three sons, his fat, stupid, ugly marine son, Leatherhead, his fatter, stupider, uglier seal son frog face and his dashing handsome real intelligent sailor son ship shape it is also revealed in another episode that he has a young adopted nephew named jesse whom he manages to cheer up by revealing to him that he too was adopted and reminding him that they are both quite lucky to have such loving families of course after that heart to heart talk Jesse is immediately kidnapped by Cobra along with the family members of other Joes and mind control to attack the Joe team. But don't worry, as always, the Joes win in the end and everyone is saved. Oh, and despite being depicted as quite the ladies' man, Shipwreck is more often than not paired frequently with fellow Joe, Covergirl. And while I don't believe there is anything official between them, they are constantly flirting with each other. Okay, fine, mostly Shipwreck. In fact, in the 2010 series G.I. Joe Renegades, while not a main character, Shipwreck, or to be more precise, a more serious and somber Captain Delgado, makes a cameo appearance as a former disgruntled ship captain for Cobra and helps the Joe team on board his ship, the Courtney, which has a poster of the model, Courtney Krieger. Turns out, Cobra sank his previous ship when he refused to dump chemicals in the ocean for them, and since then, the captain has harbored quite the grudge against his former employers. Anyway, despite being featured quite heavily in the cartoons, for some reason, Shipwreck wasn't much of a factor in the original Marvel Comics run. I mean, he was there, but his depiction was nowhere near his colorful cartoon counterpart and from what I recall, was never really involved in any memorable storylines. Hell, I'd argue that Polly had an even more memorable appearance in the Devil's Jew comics, wherein he starred in a very short but humorous story wherein he dreamt that he was the leader of a Joe sub-team called the Primal Emergency Tactical Squad. Or Pets, for short, which consisted of fellow Joe animals including the dogs Junkyard, Order, and Lamont, Freedom the Eagle, Max the Bobcat, Sandstorm the Coyote, Finback the Dolphin, and of course, Timber the Wolf, their wolf, and their castle. As they battled the Cobra team called Beasts, or the Brute Enforcement, and Slithery Terrorists team, comprised of Raptors Falcon General Ledger, Croc Masters Crocodile Fiona, Naga Hides Boar Porkbelly, Voltars Vulture, and a host of snakes, scorpions, iguanas, manta rays, and barracudas. Man, that's a whole lot of animals. On the toy front, before the original run of a real American hero toy line came to an end in 1994, Hasbro managed to release one more version of Shipwreck as part of their Battle Corps line, wherein he is given the official designation of a Navy SEAL. Humorously, this specific toy was used in the live-action Nickelodeon TV series Action League Now for a character named Stinky Diver, a former Navy commando with an attitude as bad as his odor. 
Years later, Shipwreck got a couple of straight-up updates as part of the 25th anniversary line. And, despite not being in the live-action movie The Rise of Cobra, Shipwreck was also included in that toy line with a more modern and tactical look to him. Still with his parrot Polly, of course. Actually, in the early stages of the sequel movie Retaliation, when it was still under the reins of the previous director Stephen Sommers, best known for the Mummy franchise, Shipwreck was supposed to be added to the Joe team to be played by the Mummy cast alum John Hanna. But when Sommers left the project, Shipwreck's inclusion was basically scrapped. Oh well. In the end, regardless of how you feel about Shipwreck, there is no denying his huge role in the G.I. Joe mythos, especially when it comes to the cartoon. So much so that I am left scratching my head at his absence up to this point in the cartoon-centric Ultimates line by Super 7. I mean, at this point, I'm not even sure if that line is dead or not, but if it ends without a Shipwreck figure, that would be one hell of a loss. Fortunately though, at the very least, Hasbro hasn't left us wanting with a pretty serviceable shipwreck in the 112 scale classified line. Okay, I admit, he's pretty cool with a removable hat that can be switched out for some lush brown hair. Actually, kinda reminds me of a toupee. But that aside though, would it have really broke the bank for them to have given us a poly with switchable spread out wings, just like his fellow feathered bird friend, Freedom? I mean, yeah, the final execution of that was kinda clunky and all, but options are always good. And speaking of options, if this story wasn't too much of a shipwreck for you, here's another Joe story that you might be interested in. Actually, here's a whole Joe playlist that you can go through. But either way, thanks for watching and I hope you come back for more.